Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here, the Eric Erickson Show across the state of Georgia. The phone number 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. We're running an interesting experiment here in in our home studio this morning. Uh, The power has gone out across middle Georgia. Not just me. Um, everyone around me in Macon has our power out. Apparently a bunch of transformers blew when people got up this morning about 6.30 to get their kids ready for school and go to work, and everybody turned up the heat at the same time. <laughs> well, uh, we have no... So I'm on a battery backup system. It tells me I have 120 minutes of power remaining. We will see. Um, so... We got a lot to cover, and if suddenly you start hearing uh, the same thing over, it's because I'm off the air uh, with with everything shut down. It, it's uh, um, they say it'll be on within the next hour. We should be good. Uh, we shall endeavor to proceed one way or the other. Uh, and I want to begin this morning with polling from the Atlanta Journal Constitution. We'll get to impeachment. The impeachment hearings start at ten. Uh, ideally. Uh, and, and note to the local stations uh, that are that are uh, carrying us. Ideally, as a commitment to local stations, when the impeachment uh, hearings begin, my plan is to run audio from the House of Representatives uh, floating in and out of it. Uh, maybe we'll do it Mystery Science Theater three thousand style uh, and uh, talk over. Bill Taylor is going to be one of the star witnesses for the Democrats this morning. Many of the Republicans in the uh, in the building have not actually heard his original testimony. Many of them did not even read his transcripts. We we will get there now. Uh, the reason I want to deal with the the Kemp stuff first is because impeachment will happen at ten, and I really want to start talking about it then. We've got some stuff to get to before then. Uh, relating to impeachment, but let's get the Kemp stuff out of the way. Um, the Atlanta Journal Constitution has a poll out that is very good news for the governor. It's actually really good news for the Republicans, even though it, some of the numbers don't look like it. And I want to explain why uh, it is actually pretty good news for the Republicans. Uh, but to begin with, Brian Kemp has a 54% approval rating among registered voters. That is key, uh, that it is among registered voters, um, because if, if you're regular listening to the program, you know my view on polling. Uh, polls of all Americans skew to the left four to six percentage points. Polls of registered voters skew to the left two to four percentage points. And uh, polls of likely voters skew to the left up to two percentage points. There are a number of reasons for this, and let me explain the, those reasons to you. Uh, among all Americans, uh, e- e- all Americans, all adult Americans, 18 and older, tend to be a more socially liberal group. Um, they don't tend to be engaged in society. They tend to have, um, how shall we say, they're not very serious views on public policy. They don't engage. They're cynical of politics, some of them, many of them. Uh, they can't vote for various reasons. Polls of registered voters, uh, registered voters tend to skew Democrat. The reason in large part is the motor voter bill from the 1990s that Paul Coverdale here in Georgia opposed. Uh, motor voter essentially um, makes it uh, pretty much automatic that you get registered to vote when you get your driver's license. That's one reason Georgia has such a huge number of people who get purged from voter rolls after eight years, because a lot of people, Georgia is one of the most liberal uh, motor voter laws in the, in the nation. You get your driver's li- license, you get registered to vote. And then you never vote, so you get dropped off the voter rolls. Um, And and people miss that part when they talk about voter suppression in Georgia. But uh, everyone who votes, uh, everyone who is registered to vote, that that group still tends to lean to the left. The people who actually engage in politics tend to be the people who pay taxes or have a vested interest in getting taxpayer money. And those people, by and large, get a very accurate snapshot. And it's a slight edge to the Democrats these days, uh, but not by much, only by two percentage points. And in, in... Election years where Democrats control the White House, Republicans have more of a vested interest in voting, and so they turn out in larger numbers. When Republicans hold the White House, Democrats turn out in larger numbers, and that's why you get these swings now among likely voters. Uh, This poll is among registered voters. It's not among all Americans in Georgia. It's among registered voters, and there's a curiosity that makes this uh, good news for the Republicans. Why? Well, let me explain to you this. They ask, I'm looking at the actual polling data. 
in the 2016 presidential election, who did you vote for? Now, hang on a second. Let me let me get this. 2016 presidential election in Georgia. I, I want to make sure I get the precise, accurate number uh, so that no one can accuse me of saying otherwise. Okay, here we go. AJC poll. Among registered voters, who did you vote for in 2016? They interviewed 1,028 people. 417 said they voted for Donald Trump. 43.2 said they voted for Hillary Clinton. 2% said Gary Johnson. 4.7% for other candidates. 5.6% said they did not vote. Uh, 2.7% refused to answer. What was the actual vote in 2016? Donald Trump got 50.4% of the vote. Hillary Clinton got 45.3% of the vote. Now, if we break this down in raw numbers, let's see. Um, dun, 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 let, me, let me get the, the full total here. Um, dun, 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 bum, let's see. Where where do we have the full breakdown? Uh, I'm Man, they make it hard to find on this. They really do. Uh, I, I don't see the full breakdown. Okay, but I can tell you. So Donald Trump got 50.44%. Hillary Clinton got 45.35%. Now, consider the AJC polling. You got uh, Hillary Clinton getting 43%, Donald Trump getting 41%. So among registered voters in this poll, Donald Trump got less, which means there is an overinflation of people who are willing to participate who were Democrat or who don't like Donald Trump. Could be independents as well. Now, the the, the numbers here, just so you, you have party identification in the polling, um, you've got... Uh, 425 Democrats, 121 independents, 415 Republicans um, for 962 total people. Um, they added in an additional 66 people of no party affiliation for 1,028 people total. What's so interesting again in this is that you have a skew towards the Democrats You have a skew towards the Democrats in the 2016 presidential vote by several percentage points that does not reconcile itself well with the actual turnout. So when you're looking, so keep in mind, the reason I've got to give you that up front is when you hear the polling numbers, remember that this is a poll that undercounts the people who voted for Donald Trump in in 2016. Now, is it a statistically valid sample? Yes, it's a statistically valid sample. Why is it a statistically valid sample? And I'm sorry, I've got my Invisalign and it's hard to say statistically when when you've got uh, braces on. Um, It is a statistically valid sample because these are registered voters. They're not likely voters. They're confirmed to be registered voters. They are people who could show up. And based on 2016 and 2018 and the margin shifts between turnout, uh, they can statistically sample that in 2020, this is the way the demographics are going to lie uh, in the race. We know, for example, in 2016, from the exit polling data, from the exit polling data, and this is important, uh, we know that it was roughly 44% Democrat, 43% Republican in the exit polling. Yeah, more people showed up to vote in 2016 by about a percentage point who said they were Democrat. And that's what the AJC has done here. So regardless of how they voted, we we can show uh, that there was an undercount for the president. But that's actually good news for the president when you actually get into the data. But before we get to the president's data, let's get to Brian Kemp's data because it's even better news for Brian Kemp. It's better news for Brian Kemp because you've got slightly less Republicans in this poll. You've got a significantly less Trump supporters in this poll. And we know from the exit polling in 2018 that Trump supporters almost one for one voted for Brian Kemp. And so what does Brian Kemp's uh, data look like? Actually, really incredibly good numbers for Brian Kemp. Uh, Well over 50 percent approval rating for Brian Kemp. 54 percent of Georgia voters give him a favorable review. That's up 46% in April, uh, 37% in January, that divisive group. Now, listen to this. Um, Most women and a fifth of Democrats approve of Brian Kemp. Despite the fetal heartbeat legislation, a majority of women in Georgia support Brian Kemp despite the fetal heartbeat legislation. Very different, is it not? Very different, is it not, from what the, the media told us would happen. 
a majority of women in Georgia support Brian Kemp. Now, let me let me delve into the cross tabs here and read you some of this. No, no, come back to me. I hit the wrong button and the poll disappeared. <laughs> Y'all, it's one of those days here as I shiver in my cold office. All right, here we go. Uh, breakdown for Brian Kemp. Um, it, overall, 26% strongly approve, 28% somewhat approve. Very good numbers here. Pollsters typically add those two together. He's well over 50% for approve in general. Among women, 51% approval rating among women. That's fantastic. 57% approval rating among men. Now, here's one of the most interesting things here. Among I want to give you the approval for education, and this is one of the the issues we're seeing across the nation now. Among people with a high school degree or less, Brian Kemp has a 70% approval rating. Among those who have a college degree, or some college rather, the governor has close to a 60% approval rating. Among those with vocational or technical school training, uh, Brian Kemp has a 70% approval rating. Among those who are college graduates, the governor has a 55% approval rating. Among those with a graduate degree, the governor has only a 46% approval rating. You get that? The more educated you are, the more likely you are to not like Brian Kemp, which is we're seeing this trend nationwide. Now, what you should understand, though, is that, let me put this in perspective. Uh, I got to pull out my calendar here because I've hit that age where I can't do math in my head anymore. Among graduate school, uh, people who have graduate degrees, 45.4% strongly or somewhat approve of the governor. Among those who disapprove and have a college degree it's 45 percent so roughly roughly tied among those with graduate study which is a good number for him but you know most people in georgia don't have a graduate degree they got high school college technical and he is overwhelmingly dominating those people overwhelmingly dominating those people he is very strong across all income ranges and now let's get into the very interesting one for the governor In the AJC polling in Georgia, Governor Brian Kemp has a super strong approval rating with white voters. He has a 67% approval rating with white voters. Actually, I take that back, a a 68% approval rating with white voters. Among black voters who overwhelmingly did not vote for Brian Kemp, they voted for Stacey Abrams, he's got a 34% approval rating. That's actually really good. Put it to you this way. He has a, he's got a, a over 50% disapproval rating among black voters, which should be expected because he's a Republican. But having a third of black voters support him gives him an edge in reelection in 2022 if he holds on to that, even with Stacey Abrams. And, you know, I, I talk to plenty of black voters who are Democrats, and they tell me that it's very, very hard for a Republican to get black voters to vote for them the first time. But once you're elected, it's very easy to get black voters to either vote for you the second time or just not vote for the Democrat, just not vote in the governor's race. They may not be willing to vote Republican, but they may be willing to not vote in that race, and that gives them an edge as well. Did you know that Mike Huckabee in Arkansas got 60% of the black vote when he ran his second term? Mike Huckabee. Yeah, that Mike Huckabee. 60% of the black voters. Uh, He got 10% his first go-round, 60% the second time. Pretty impressive. But here's the other impressive number. Among Hispanic voters in Georgia, Brian Kemp got 39.7% of the Hispanic vote when he ran for office. It's not a large number of people. Keep that in mind. But it is the fastest growing demographic in the state of Georgia. He got 39.7%. In this poll, he's got a 44.4% approval rating among Hispanic voters. Do you know, he hasn't made that Senate appointment yet. I, and, you know, my friend Jason Anavadarte, he, he 
has put his hat in the ring. He is a on the Board of Education in Paulding County, highly plugged into the Hispanic community in Georgia. And I, I still think he would be a great pick. I'm biased because he's a friend of mine. I, I think I've been saying for a while the the fastest growing demographic in Georgia is Hispanic voters, and they are showing a propensity to vote for the Republicans. Uh, we should try to figure out a way to lock them in. I think you give them the first Hispanic, uh, non-Cuban Hispanic senator. Uh, you give them a huge win. I shouldn't say for yeah, first Cuban, uh, first non-Cuban Hispanic senator. He'd be the first senator from Puerto Rico, native Puerto Rican. Um, I think I think it's a no-brainer. Uh, he would give a diverse pick. He's a solid Republican. He's solidly pro-life. He's solidly on on the president's economic agenda. He, it, it makes sense there. And this polling should buttress that to some degree. Now, I don't know who the governor's going to pick. I have no inside information, and I refuse to talk to them about it because I'm sure they're overwhelmed by all sorts of people. But you got 40, you got 39.7% of the Hispanic vote in 2018. You're at 44.4% approval rating among Hispanic voters in Georgia. It just seems to me that you do what you can to boost your popularity among Hispanic voters. You do not have to sell out your agenda. The, bri- the governor has gotten to 44.4% approval among Hispanic voters without compromising his agenda. He could pull this off. So during the commercial break, I went to the Georgia Power website. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. If you're just tuning in, uh, I'm I'm in a home studio and uh, we are without power today. Uh, We we are Transformers Blue this morning when everyone got up to turn their heat on at the same time around 630 this morning that started flicker was gone by by eight o'clock this morning. They say it'll be back on by 1030, thankfully. But so I went on the Georgia Power website. They have a map of outages. There are outages right now all over the state of Georgia Um, is Savannah, Brunswick, Columbus, um, Americus. Uh, Augusta, uh, Clayton, Tacoa, Gainesville, Greensboro, Fort Oglethorpe, Rome. Uh, lots of people with flow, uh, power flickering this morning from power lines uh, down because of the rain and the trees. Um, it just, oh well, we'll deal with it. It'll be back on in a little while. Uh, now, uh, let's get into the presidential polling in the AJC. For just tuning in, Brian Kemp, uh, great polling for Brian Kemp in the AJC poll. This is a poll that undercounts uh, supporters of the president. Uh, this is a poll of registered voters, and it showed that the um, the president only got 41% of the people who, of the support of the people participating in the poll, but the president got 50% in Georgia. So, you can see that there's a big shift in this polling, and that actually gives advantages to Republicans. So Brian Kemp, in this poll of people where only 41% voted for the president, he's got a 54% approval rating, which means he's probably got a 60% approval rating in reality, which is pretty significant. There is not good news for the president here, but again, again, um, the president, uh, this polling undercounts the president's performance, and you got to keep that in mind. Let me just give you the the, the top line numbers for uh, the AJC. It says that Joe Biden would beat Donald Trump 51 to 43, uh, fueled by solid support for women and independents. Uh, races between any of the other Democratic candidates would be very tight. And again, you got to keep in mind, this is a registered voter poll. 54% of registered voters disapprove of the president's record. 44% approve. Now, Let's shift this a little bit to what is probably likely voters. Let's decrease the 54 by four percentage points, and you get to 50%. Let's increase the approval rating by by 4%, and you you get 48%. So 50, 48, disapprove, approve within the margin of error. So it's roughly tied. And I think you can do that. Now, here's the other interesting one, and this is why I think – Uh, where we can see the flaw in the polling as it relates. 50% of Georgians approve of David Perdue's job performance. Only about a third say they support him in next year's election. 41% says their choice depends on who the nominee is. When you see that number, you can tell there's a deep flaw in the polling. 50% of Georgians approve of David Perdue's job performance, but only a third said they'll support him next year. there's There's a clear problem there in that polling. 
Um, likewise, if you take 50 percent, add four percentage points to it, you, you got 54 percent among likely voters. Uh, I think that will you vote for him or not? It, it, it relates to the president's polling in this that only 41 percent of the people who participated in the poll voted for the president. But in reality, 50 percent of the people in Georgia voted for the president. I, I think there are some flaws in the polling. And those flaws actually are good news for the Republicans, not for the Democrats. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm trading emails actually with the national pollster who saw me tweeting out some of the remarks on um, uh, on this polling, and he just emailed back. Let me, let me read you what he said. Actually, bad sample from the AJC. Very good news for the Republicans in Georgia. AJC oversampled people with graduate degrees. More than the population exists in Georgia also undercounted Trump voters. Uh, therefore, adds several percentage points up for all of them, period. <laughs> period. <laughs> My brain, the way it works sometimes. Then he says this, uh, something I was actually tweeting out as his email came in. Remember how fetal heartbeat was going to kill Brian Kemp. Never trust pundits. (laughs) You you know, it's right. Um, Remember, that so much of the, the media coverage last year, earlier this year, was about how the fetal heartbeat legislation was going to devastate uh, Republicans in Georgia. It was going to wipe them out. It was going to make 2020 competitive. The GOP was going to go down. The legislature was going to go to the Democrats. The Democrats were positively giddy about it. Brian Kemp has majority support of women. And now what this pollster is telling me is that the AJC statistically oversampled people with graduate degrees in Georgia and still finds the governor doing well with that group and still finds a majority support with women. Pretty impressive data there. And consider, again, David Perdue. Uh, David Perdue is at 50% in a poll that finds the president only got 41% support in 2016, which we know isn't true. Your baseline there has got to be adjusted in that regard. And he's doing well. Oh, by the way, HBO is filming a new series in Macon. Um, There was a big story in the Macon Telegraph yesterday how downtown in Macon on 2nd Street, uh, all the facades of of the shops have been changed to reflect this HBO series. They're filming this week down there. It's some sort of gothic horror show that's coming to HBO. Uh, they, they've got it all up and running now, and e, they're filming. I, I thought there was going to be a boycott. No, there's there's not going to be a boycott. This is good news for the Republicans, this AJC poll, particularly because of a skewed sample, according to... Hang on a second. One second. I, I This is so unprofessional of me, but, but a, a, another pollster has just emailed me who you guys would know he's done polling for a lot of prominent Republicans around the country. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Same thing. Okay, so th- this is a this pollster has done polling in Georgia uh, and is basically said uh, garbage poll. He, he's criticizing the University of Georgia's polling uh, and says garbage poll uh, in large part because of the oversampling of categories of voters, including graduates. So uh, you got now two major prominent pollsters. Uh, you would know both names are on TV all the time. And uh, they're both saying garbage poll because of the sample. Really good news for the GOP based on what they're pulling out of these samples. So there you have it. Um, it, it wouldn't wouldn't play. You know, I wonder, I don't want to nurse conspiracy theories on polling, but I, I, I really, here's the thing. The University of Georgia has started doing more polling because other colleges are doing polling. Every, every college does polls. Emerson College does polls. Monmouth University does polls. Uh, Quinnipiac does polls. Quinnipiac actually is the the trendsetter. Quinnipiac's been doing them for years, and they have a track record. They have a model. Uh, we can measure them up. They've got a history of, of accuracy. Monmouth is increasingly that way. But a lot of these other universities that are now stepping up and doing polling, they're doing them because other universities and colleges are doing polling, and they want their name out there. So the AJC and UGA, they partner for a poll. UGA gets some headlines there, and, and, and good for you. UGA and and good for the AJC. That doesn't mean that it's good polling, though. And I don't know that UGA has the best track record thus far uh, in the poll. So now that being said, let's move to impeachment now. Yes, Siri, let's move to impeachment. Bill Taylor is going to testify this morning, and I'm not going to engage in disparaging Bill Taylor. Bill Taylor is a, a veteran who has loyally served this country. 
you will hear a lot of people on TV today cast dispersions on Bill Taylor. I, I'm not going to go along with it. That being said, uh, I think the Republican talking point this morning on Bill Taylor, the best one they have and the one that works is Bill Taylor never talked to the president of the United States. And because he never talked to the president of the United States, we, we don't really know what Bill Taylor is going to say. Uh, other, well, we, I, I take the back. We know what he's going to say from his transcript, but, but we, we don't know that Bill Taylor really knows the president's state of mind. And this quid pro quo stuff is going to be based on the president's state of mind. What we can expect is that the Democrats today are going to try to draw out that state of mind. They're going to try to build a case on quid pro quo, but they're beginning to shift their language and that they're shifting their language in this way, I think is problematic for them. I want to play uh, two Democrats talking about this. This is uh, Congresswoman Speer. Uh, on CNN, you're going to hear then from Congressman Heck, also Democrat, uh, talking on CNN. Actually, Aaron, I have been speaking out about the potentiality of it being bribery for some time. The elements of bribery are there. You have a president using his official office, um, using taxpayer money to demand from a foreign government that they um, br- are bribed to do an investigation to dig up dirt on the president's opponent in the upcoming election. Uh, the corrupt intent is there as well in many ways. Uh, probably the most obvious is that they put the uh, transcript or the summary of that phone call on July 25th into a special server so that they could cover it up. Uh, not to mention the fact that there are many other um, evidence of uh, corrupt intent in that the president has lied. He said that it was a verbatim uh, transcript when in fact it was a summary and uh, there is evidence now that um, things were kept out of that summary. But we have the corpus and the corpus is the summary of the telephone call which the president corroborated himself by releasing it. Now that's that's Congresswoman Speer. Now I want to play Congressman Heck, and then we'll we'll get into this talking point from the Democrats. Remains to be seen. The American public is going to have its first opportunity to actually see and hear uh, these patriots, these foreign diplomats, this decorated war veteran who have served both Republicans and Democratic administrations. It's not just ink on a page anymore. They get to actually hear what they have to say. Moreover, there is always the prospect that somebody will ask a question that in some way reveals new information, including that which wasn't even uh, disclosed in the deposition thus far. As you point out, we have already seen the closed door testimony that has been released now from Ambassador Bill Taylor, others who are set to appear publicly. Why do you think this will change minds? Well, first of all, I don't know that everybody's tuned in quite yet to ink on a page, as I say, uh, depositions in the written word. But I think uh, there'll be an increased and acute heightened awareness of what's going on here. Look, we're all returning to the nation's capital with uh, an extremely sober feeling. It's, it, it's, it actually causes us to be pretty reflective. It's impossible to exaggerate the gravity of what we're about to undertake when you consider that this is the second most serious responsibility that the Congress has, second only to its authority to declare war. So listen, people are going to be tuning in, and some of them will be hearing it for the first time. Some of them will be receiving it uh, in ways that are more powerful than ink on a page. And thirdly, there is the prospect that there'll be new information really uh, released. So I, I do think that people's minds are going to be changed and shaped because the truth is there is a mountain of evidence, a mountain of evidence that the president did in fact bribe or extort Ukraine in an attempt to satisfy his own personal political gain. Notice the language shift. They've gone from quid pro quo to bribe or extort. Do you know why they've gone to quid pro quo? from bribe or extort, they they really don't have a choice in the matter. And the reason they, they don't have a choice in the matter is because the Democrats have given the Republicans an incredible gift in their own use of rhetoric when it comes to Israel and foreign policy. The Democrats have, in fact, uh, basically embraced the quid pro quo rhetoric. Uh, listen to this montage. Well, let me reroute the audio here. Uh, I'm doing this on the fly solution is to say to Israel is you got 3.8 billion dollars every single year All right. if you want military aid you're going to have to fundamentally change your relationship to the people of Gaza 
That's and so this is not just rejoining the Paris Climate Accords, which I will do right away. It's actually using every lever of foreign policy we have for more foreign aid to countries making a contingent on climate That's uh, a quid action. Pro quo. You, would, you would not necessarily want to leverage U.S. aid to Israel to push him to do that, is what you're saying? Well, you know, that would not be my first move. Uh, I'm not saying that would never happen. We need That's to make sure quote. that any such cooperation and funding is going to things that are compatible with U.S. objectives and with U.S. That's law. a quid pro quo. A few billion dollars on aid to Israel. Um, would you ever consider using that aid as leverage to get the Israeli government to act differently? Absolutely. That's a quid pro quo. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Question about Israel. Will you make American aid conditional on a freeze to settlement building? It is the official policy of the United States of America to support a two-state solution. And if Israel is moving in the opposite direction, then everything is on the table. And That's a quid pro quo. Everything is on the table. I said, I'm telling you, you're not getting a billion dollars. I said, you're not getting a billion. I'm going to be leaving here. And I think it was, what, six hours? I looked, I said, I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Oh, son of a bitch. That's a quid pro quo. <laughs> Got fired. That's a quid pro quo. Uh, that's why they got to move on from the quid pro quo. Now, listen, let me state for as a matter of intellectual honesty, it is a huge difference uh, between steering American foreign policy based on other countries conforming to American public policy and steering American aid dollars to help yourself politically. That is a huge difference. And I'm sorry if you can't see it, but it is a huge fundamental difference. Any president using his power to get a foreign government to dig up dirt on a political opponent is bad. Is it impeachable, though? It's going to be the question. Uh, what was the president's state of mind? Uh, was he doing this because he really wanted dirt on Joe Biden, or was he doing it because he really wanted dirt on the Democrats? Did he want dirt overall? Did he want dirt on a narrative? And part of the problem here is Rudy Giuliani. Because uh, Rudy Giuliani seemingly is the culprit here who convinced the president of the United States that he, Rudy Giuliani, could dig up dirt on the Democrats and show that the Democrats were engaged in hypocrisy, that it was actually the Democrats working with foreign governments to try to dig up dirt on Donald Trump. All the while, Democrats were accusing Donald Trump of working with the Russians. And the all lines run through Ukraine, and all lines run through Rudy Giuliani convincing the president of this stuff. Uh, the Republican strategy in impeachment at this point is going to be that uh, Rudy Giuliani is the fall guy. Rudy Giuliani screwed this up. Rudy Giuliani uh, planted seeds in Donald Trump's mind that led to him making mistakes uh, by relying on Rudy Giuliani. And I think that that is going to probably save the president because, frankly, Rudy, Rudy did kind of screw up. I know people don't want to say it, but this is a former federal prosecutor, former mayor of New York, and he has just completely become unglued. He's he's trying to defend the president in the Wall Street Journal this morning, and Republicans on Capitol Hill are rolling their eyes, wishing he would just go away. Several of the Republicans in the Senate have privately gone to the president, I am told, and told the president, you need to get him to go away. You need to make him disappear. You need to stop listening to him because he is going to get you impeached. Uh, Rudy Giuliani is the man who caused the president to take actions, those actions uh, now leading to this impeachment. Here's Kellyanne Conway talking about impeachment uh, on Fox News. Every witness up there so far has said uh, I assumed, I interpreted, it's conjecture. I, I heard it from somebody, heard it from somebody, heard it from somebody, and here's my interpretation. Folks, that is not how we impeach and remove presidents who are democratically elected. That's how the cheerleaders find out which, which one of them is going to be asked to the prom by the quarterback. He said, she said, he said, he thinks, I interpreted. CIA does not stand for conjecture, interpretation, and assumptions. What are we doing? We're going to impeach and remove a president who was democratically elected, handily, by the way, in the Electoral College, and close to being reelected less than a year away, because people on, on Capitol Hill don't like him, and the 2020 crowd has no idea how to beat him at the ballot box. This is America. This is a democracy. I still think the best argument for the Republicans is that the election is less than a year away. Impeachment is a political process. So, too, is the election. Let the voters decide. 
I still think it is a legit argument, and I know I'm in the minority on this, but I think it's so. I think it is a legitimate argument that what could have been impeachable two years ago or even a year ago is not impeachable when you're less than a year from the election, that the political process to use in that case is the uh, Republican voters. I don't have a problem with the impeachment inquiry, and I'm getting attacked by some Trump supporters for saying uh, that I don't have a problem with the impeachment inquiry. I, I, I Let the Democrats hammer this out. Let them be distracted. Let the president be on the campaign trail. Let the Democrats be out there campaigning. Uh, let the Democrats be out there distracted by this. Tie up the Senate in knots for eight weeks. By the way, Richard Burr, the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, is coming out and saying the Senate trial could take six to eight weeks. It would run all day, every day except Sunday, and the Senate sergeant-at-arms will admonish the members of the Senate. Get this. According to the rules of impeachment, no senator will be allowed to ask questions. There can be no grandstanding in the Senate. All questions that senators wish to be asked have to be handed to the Chief Justice of the United States, who himself will ask the question if he considers the question pertinent. So there's no grandstanding by the senators. You've got Kamala Harris, you got Cory Booker, you got Bernie Sanders. Um, who else you got? You got Amy Klobuchar. You, they're all in the Senate. They will be tied in knots. Joe Biden is loving this. The House Democrats are giving Pete Buttigieg and um, and Joe Biden and Mike Bloomberg a huge advantage by doing this this close to the election. Uh, Mitch McConnell will ensure this trial takes some time. They will I- ensure that it is dragged out, and they will ensure the president is not convicted, and the president will be on the campaign trail while the Democrats in the Senate are stuck, unable to leave. In fact, the Senate sergeant-at-arms will admonish them according to the rules on impeachment in the Senate. Going back to Andrew Johnson, the Senate sergeant-at-arms will admonish the senators that should they be vocal or should they leave, they will be arrested. Should they be vocal or should they leave, they will be arrested. Do the Senate Democrats really want impeachment? It's beginning to dawn on them that they got all sorts of problems if this goes forward. I got to play this montage from the Washington Free Beacon. I haven't even seen it yet. I just got sent to me. We need to watch this together. Uh, I think this has been a disaster for the Democrats, and I think it's been a disaster for the reputation of Robert Mueller. As they were using him for clarity, he'd somehow fog it up. On optics, this was a disaster. But he- a lot of Democrats in particular used the D word and branded this a disaster early on. I think the country watching and saying, OK, we've been waiting for this. What was this that we just saw? Ultimately, it didn't land where the Democrats said. From the Democratic perspective, to me so far, it's been a bit of a bust. I hate to be the contrarian on the network. I did not think it went well. Was the ball advanced? No. Impeachment's over. I think the likelihood of impeachment went down sharply today. I thought he was uh, boring. I thought in some cases he was uh, sort of evasive. I thought Mueller's performance was uninspired. He was clipped. He was confused at times. He did not persuade anybody. He seemed lost at times. He was the FBI director when I worked for George W. Bush. To be honest, this was not the Robert Mueller I knew. But he wouldn't actually say what happened. I thought that was frustrating. There were times in the hearing when he was sharp as a tack. Uh, but we can't avoid the fact that there were times in the hearing that he was not. You do not have that viral movie trailer moment of Robert Mueller looking directly into a camera and saying something in 15 or 20 seconds that the Democrats can spread around the world. And was that intentional for him to be less relevant? <laughs> yeah, well, he certainly succeeded. It was like watching a passionate conversation with an answering machine. Hey, and I expected perhaps uh, a little bit more forceful defense of this investigation. Robert Mueller, as you can see in these clips, if you didn't get a chance to see the hearing today, was evasive and restless, and sometimes he did not appear to have full command of the report that he issued. There were also times when it seemed like he was unfamiliar with parts of the investigation. Now, I don't know if he couldn't hear or if actually he is not as well-versed with this report as, as many of the people on this panel are right now. A very ineffective defense of his own work. They have <coughs> to make the decision. Are they going to impeach him? Or are they not going to impeach him? If they're going to impeach him, get going. But I haven't been his staffer for 22 months inside the hermetically sealed special counsel's team. So if anyone on that team, if any one of those people knew that this is what would happen today, shame on them. (laughs) 
that that was about the Mueller here. And, you know, this is such a great montage because it, it's very clear uh, twofold. The media and the Democrats alike have been dying to get to impeachment. And they really thought Mueller would do it, and they, and Mueller didn't, and so now they've got this. You know what's going to be interesting today? Uh, Adam Schiff has sent out a memo to members of the committee, uh, the Intelligence Committee, that they're not allowed to ask for the name of the whistleblower. There are a lot of people, including some of you listening right now, who think there's no reason to bring up the whistleblower anymore. There's no reason to bring up the whistleblower because the whistleblower, um, we've got all the the firsthand knowledge we need, people who are on the phone call. We've got other people who had knowledge. The whistleblower doesn't. This is, an, this is a political process. And I want to spend a little bit, when we come back, on my philosophical objection to keeping the whistleblower confidential. And feel free to disagree. You can call in here if you want. 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Disagree or agree with me, you can call in. Um, But I got a real philosophical objection on keeping this whistleblower private. And I suspect we're going to see more than one Republican today try to out the whistleblower uh, because there's a partisan angle with the whistleblower if reports are to be believed. We'll explore that as well. Over a hundred million people have had their personal information stolen in data breaches, social security numbers, contact details, credit scores, so much more, all taken from Capital One customers. There's a good chance you were affected. These kinds of attacks are getting more frequent and more severe, and it's not just Capital One. Equifax, Facebook, eBay, Uber, PlayStation, Yahoo, they've all had uh, leaked password issues, credit card issues, bank number issues. In fact, I had to get a new debit card last week. It just showed up in the house with a note saying one of the online vendors uh, had information compromised. And so you need to use something like ExpressVPN to help ignore this stuff. You can't control how big corporations mishandle your data. You need to understand that. But you can protect yourself. ExpressVPN is an app for your computer and phone. It encrypts and secures your data. If a breach can happen to Capital One, it can happen to you. Now, you won't don't want to go online without ExpressVPN. And if you care about your privacy and safety... You really need ExpressVPN. It connects with just a click. It's lightning fast. It costs less than 7 bucks a month. And it's the number one VPN provider by TechRadar, CNET, The Verge, countless others. Use my special link, expressvpn.com slash Eric. Right now, arm yourself with an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. Support the show. Protect yourself. Get ExpressVPN. That's expressvpn.com slash Eric for an extra three months. It is Eric Erickson here. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show. Oh, my goodness gracious. Uh, we, we have had power outages throughout middle Georgia this morning as everyone got up at the same time and turned their heaters on, and the power literally came back on a minute or two ago. <laughs> I have So I've got a battery backup, and I had 44 minutes of power left on the battery backup. Uh, so Uh, We were cutting it close. Thank you, Georgia Power, for getting the power back on as quickly as possible. Um, The impeachment hearings are underway on Capitol Hill. We will float in and out with audio uh, of what's going on on Capitol Hill this morning. I I want to start, though, uh, very specifically with my view on the whistleblower, because I got a philosophical view on this. Uh, that it, it makes some people mad, but I want to explain it to you. And to explain it to you, we should go back to Roman times. Oh, yes, there's a history angle here. The Praetorian Guard uh, in, in Rome protected the emperor. And in the later stages of the Roman Empire, the Praetorian Guard uh, exerted... Uh, very strong say in uh, who should be the emperor and would insert themselves inappropriately into the conversation and more than once assassinated an emperor and put their own person in charge. And we don't need a Praetorian guard in our bureaucracy. Let's say it's true. And it just, if you're new here, if you haven't listened when I've said it, I'm I'm not going to name the person suspected of being the whistleblower. I, I realize that he's out there in the conservative press. But I have a, a I got an objection to this, even though it's looking more and more like he is. And if if there are a few other data points connected, 
I will I will name the person publicly myself. Um, I, I'm not opposed to naming the whistleblower on grounds of oh the whistleblower needs to be protected. In fact, I think the whistleblower needs to be outed. I just want to make doubly sure that it's the right person. I, I would hate to say it's the wrong person and and have this person get death threats and stuff, as I'm sure they undoubtedly are uh, getting harassed right now. I, and I, I think we should be mindful of that. But I think the whistleblower needs to be public. Now, here, here there are a couple of angles that I need to take with you on this. On one side of this, you have Republicans who say this is politically motivated. And the reason they say it's politically motivated is if this is the whistleblower, this person has blown the whistle repeatedly on the president uh, and has done so largely because he doesn't like the things the president has done and he doesn't like them from the angle of he's undermining President Obama's agenda, the president of the United States is. And if that's the case, and this person is the partisan hack he appears to be, um, then I think it is deeply relevant uh, whether you say or not that, well, all of his facts bear out. And it's true. Much of what he claimed uh, has borne out. But let's also acknowledge that he has done a lot of this with a, a lawyer, and he coordinated in advance with the Democrats. And I think that we're in a political if we're in a political process and impeachment is a political process, then the partisan angle of the whistleblower is deeply relevant to the political process that is impeachment. But there's a larger issue here, and it goes to anonymous as well. Anonymous being the person writing the book, uh, that book being a, a essentially all the bad things President Trump has done. Let me play you this clip from Nikki Haley. I don't- I don't know what to think about Anonymous. I mean, when I think about it, it's really offensive to me because here you've got a person hiding behind a curtain, just throwing stones. And I think it's arrogant, it's cowardly, and I don't know what the end game is. Mm -hmm. But my issue is, if it was that important, show us your face, show us your voice and stand in front of the world and say what you're going to say. But to really hide behind a curtain like this, why would anybody trust Anonymous. Was it offensive to you when people thought it was you? It was offensive to me when I first read the anonymous op-ed, so much so that I responded with no ask of anyone from the White House, Mm -hmm. because there were a lot of us trying to do really good work there. And then here you have someone who secretly goes out and says that and causes the stir that was so unnecessary. And so it was disrespectful to those of us who were trying to do the right thing. And yes, I mean, obviously, the suspicion was over all of us, right? Because it was, well, who is that? But anybody that worked in the White House, and certainly the president, knew my commitment to him and the administration and what I was trying to do. The president of the United States, regardless of who the president is, needs to be able to trust the people who advise him in the career civil service sector. And this individual was a careerist. He wasn't a political appointee. He was a careerist in the intelligence community. Forget about Donald Trump. What about the next president? Will the next president be able to say, hmm, I can trust the whistle. I can trust the intelligence community. They're not going to be out to get me. Let's let's remember here. That going back to 2017, the president made some remarks about the intelligence community and people within the intelligence community started saying and and whistle and and lawyers on the outside, including the lawyer for the whistleblower, started saying, oh, they're going to be out to get the president. They're going to do everything they can to stop him now that he's gone to war with them. It is not the role of the civil service. It is not the role of the intelligence community. It is not the role of the law enforcement community to go to war with the president of the United States because they don't like that. He doesn't like them or doesn't trust them. They undermine trust. They undermine trust. In the institutions, and that's why I think if you're in that community and you want to blow the whistle on the president, and by the way, the whistleblower statute does not apply to the commander in chief. It applies to agency heads and others. There were plenty of people the whistleblower could have gone to within the president's administration, plenty of people he could have gone to. Instead, where did he go? He went to Adam Schiff, a partisan Democrat in charge of the House Intelligence Committee. He didn't go to Richard Burr, who has shown himself to be above board and straight-laced. He didn't go there. He didn't go to Mark Warner. He went to Adam Schiff, a partisan Democrat. It is clear to me that the whistleblower had a partisan agenda. And I think given that, the whistleblower 
it requires to come forward. It's required to come forward. If you're in the intelligence community and you want to take out the king, you need to put your head out there. I absolutely fundamentally believe that. And it has nothing to do with Donald Trump. And you know how I can tell you in, with a straight face it doesn't have anything to do with Donald Trump? When people within the intelligence community were leaking stuff on Barack Obama, I said it was wrong. That the president needed to be able to trust his intelligence community. There was already a bias among Democrats against the intelligence and, and military community. And they should not be leaking negative things about the president. They should be public if they wanted to do it. I said it then. I maintain it now. Intellectual consistency here between Democrats and Republicans. If you're going to try to take out the president from within the intelligence and law enforcement community of the federal government, do it publicly. Man up and get out there. And the whistleblower statute really doesn't protect you against the commander in chief. Now, I had somebody call in yesterday and say, well, well, why are they treating him? Why are they treating him as it does? Because it's a it's partisan showmanship. And the Democrats rule the roost on this. If Doug Collins were to come out there today and uh, out the whistleblower, he would be taken off his committee. The majority of Democrats in, in Congress would probably try to expel him. They would censor him. They would silence him. They would punish him. So he's not going to do it. But I think the whistleblower himself needs to come out, and the longer he stays hidden, the more I think this isn't about him trying to do the right thing. This is about him trying to take out a president he did not like. And if the reports are to be believed, this whistleblower is a partisan progressive activist who has time and time again complained about the president to people, trying to get them to out the president. And there's a real question of whether or not this person has leaked information in the past to Democrats to try to hurt the president. He should come forward. That's my philosophical objection there. Now, uh, I want to play some audio here. This is Adam Schiff. He is speaking. The impeachment inquiry is underway. In the weeks that followed, Ambassador Taylor learned new facts about a scheme that Sondland, even Sondland, would describe as becoming more insidious. Taylor texted Sondland, quote, Are we now saying that security assistance and White House meeting are conditioned on investigations? As summer turned to fall, it kept getting more insidious, Mr. Sondland testified. Mr. Taylor, who took notes of his conversation, said the ambassador told him in a September 1st phone call that everything was dependent on the public announcement of investigations, including security assistance. President Trump wanted Mr. Zelensky in a public box. President Trump is a businessman, Sondland said later. When a businessman is about to sign a check to someone who owes him something, the businessman asks that person to pay up before signing the check. In a sworn declaration after Taylor's testimony, Sondland would admit to telling Ukrainians at a September 1st meeting in Warsaw, quote, that resumption of U.S. aid would likely not occur until Ukraine provided the public anti-corruption statement that we have been discussing for many weeks. The president's chief of staff confirmed Trump's efforts to coerce Ukraine by withholding aid. When Mick Mulvaney was asked publicly about it, his answer was breathtaking. We do that all the time with foreign policy, he said. I have news for everybody. Get over it. There's going to be political... That's Adam Schiff. He is the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. He is not the face the Democrats should have for this. He is a partisan operative. He coordinated in advance with the whistleblower. Uh, You know, in fairness, Republicans have in the past uh, coordinated behind closed doors with whistleblowers before going public. Benghazi was one of those ways. Multiple Republicans uh, have been very open about the fact that prior to beginning the public uh, trot out of the Benghazi story, the people who were affected met behind closed doors with Republicans in Congress, uh, and they coordinated on how best to get the story out there. But they were all assailed by the press as partisan. Notice how the press is circling the wagons on this whistleblower. And notice you've got, um, you've got Adam Schiff, who coordinated with the whistleblower, being the one championing keeping the whistleblower quiet. And has changed his story himself. Uh Uh-oh, breaking news. Uh, Jim Jordan is on the committee, and he's rocking in his chair, and he's not wearing his jacket. You can always tell who Jim Jordan is because he's not wearing his jacket. (laughs) Anyway, Schiff did this. 
That's why the whistleblower should come forward. If we're going to have a Praetorian Guard effort to take out the President of the United States, at least do it publicly uh, so that we can we can inquire as to why and assess whether or not it was genuine or whether or not uh, it was a partisan affair. And it looks to me like it was a partisan affair here, given who this whistleblower seems to be and all the things that he has uh, done against the President in the past. Now, uh, I want to do something. Uh, I'm going to go on and take a commercial time out a little early earlier than I normally would. The reason being, I want to be able to play some of the testimony when these guys start testifying so you can hear it for yourself, hear what they're saying. we got a lot of other stuff we need to talk about as well, including that when, right when we come back, I want to move into Georgia. The president of the United States came to Atlanta on Friday, started a Black Voters for Trump coalition. You know who's going to do it now? Pete Buttigieg. Yeah, that's right. He's coming to do a Black Voter Coalition. The why is actually pretty funny, and I'll explain when we come back. It is Eric Erickson here, the Eric Erickson Show across the state of Georgia. The phone number, if you'd like to be on the program, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Pete Buttigieg. I've been saying Buttigieg, but several people tell me it's Boot. Boot Edge Edge. Buttigieg. See, I, I just, I think, I mean, forget the fact that he's a, a gay millennial mayor from, from South Bend, Indiana. I think that he's got a last name nobody knows how to say is the biggest impediment to Pete Buttigieg getting elected president of the United States. Pete Buttigieg is coming to Atlanta to to mirror mirror the president of the United States. He is uh, going to he wants to be the um, he, he wants to rally black voters. And um, he's he wants to build a coalition. The reason is because Pete Buttigieg has like zero support in the polls among black voters. It's actually kind of funny. It's kind of sad, but it's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> he's got like zero, zero percent support within the black community. Zero percent support. And I think one poll had him at two percent, which the statistical sample was plus or minus five percent. So I, I some commentator on TV said, you know, he may actually have negative three percent support of the black community. <laughs> I mean, seriously, when you got a poll that says he's got two percent support. In the black community, and you got a 5% margin of error, he could have a negative number of black support. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, the average polling for Pete Buttigieg in the black community is zero. So, Barack, uh, Barack, uh, Donald Trump came to Atlanta on Friday. He started a Black Voters for Trump coalition. And uh, Pete Buttigieg is coming to Atlanta to do a Black Voters for Pete Coalition. It won't be for Buttigieg, uh, Buttigieg because nobody will be able to say it. Uh, it'll be for Pete. Uh, black voters for Mayor Pete. That's what it'll be. Uh, and it will be, well, it will be, you know, I got in trouble here last week for saying Republicans often put on stage with them um, the, the sorts of black voters who show up at Republican meetings on a Saturday, which uh, anyone who shows up at a Republican meeting on a Saturday, regardless of race, is not your normal person. I mean, uh, let's just be honest. Those of you who are listening right now and your Republican uh, members who show up at Republican meetings on a Saturday morning once a month to talk politics, you ain't normal. I mean, and that was for the longest time me. Let's just acknowledge that most Americans are either with their family or sleeping in on Saturday, that they're not getting up to go hang out and talk politics. And if you're a black voter getting up on a Saturday morning to hang out with a bunch of Republicans at a coffee and talk politics, uh, you are very much outside the norm of your community. Uh, because black voters on a Saturday morning, they ain't going to Republican meetings. And those are the people, because the Republicans know them, they're the ones who get on stage. Well, the same is true on the Democratic side. If you're if you're a white, gay, mil married, millennial mayor from Indiana and you come to Georgia and you get a bunch of uh, black voters, you're you're probably not getting the people. And this was the genius of what the president did on Friday is that the president uh, defied what Republicans typically do. The president on Friday put up on stage with him a bunch of successful people um, who, who they are active in their community. They're not card carry members of the Republican Party, but they're voting for Donald Trump. 
And uh, my goodness gracious, uh, that sort of stuff matters. It absolutely matters. And I, sorry, um, I, I I think that Buttigieg is going to have a hard time. He's going to get the the urban, sophisticated black voter of Atlanta who a lot of black voters will look at and say, that person doesn't really reflect my life, nor is it someone I aspire to be. We'll see. Maybe he can dazzle, surprise, and amaze me. We'll see. Um, I think he's going to have some issues, though. And I don't think there's any reason to dance around the fact that he's probably going to have some issues. But his biggest issue is that he's gay and married. And I, I don't mean that disparagingly. Don't hear me say that disparagingly. I mean that in that his own focus group has said that. Pete Buttigieg did a focus group in South Carolina to see, because South Carolina is going to be one of the early states, going to have big primaries, going to be overwhelmingly African-American, and he wanted to see how he plays in the black community. So he he did a big focus group of black voters in South Carolina, and you know what his own focus group, this is Pete Buttigieg's own focus group found that black voters aren't comfortable voting for someone who is in your face gay. And I mean that from, from the way this has been discussed, from the people familiar with the survey, that he is married, he makes no bones about it, it is just, it, it, it's who he is. And black voters have no problems voting for a gay person. They're just not quite comfortable voting for a gay married man uh, whose uh, husband is out on the campaign trail with him. They're not comfortable with it. They don't think they're there yet. And it's a negative for him. And that's from his own data. So he's got to do something. And having a bunch of um, elitist gay black voices which is what he's done in the last couple of weeks. And I don't think he's done it intentionally, but those are the voices who have come out to defend him saying that, that black voters don't have a problem with gay people. I'm black, I'm gay, I'm progressive. Uh, I'm accepted in my community. That's not the smart way to do it because oftentimes those people live in a coastal city in a bubble of elite opinion. And so of course they're readily accepted, but are you going to get a black voter in Valdosta? To vote for an openly gay Democrat who is married and only a mayor and nothing else and a millennial. Are are you going to get them? Are you going to get Columbus, uh, a black voter in Columbus or Athens or or South Atlanta to do that? I, I don't know that you can. And the fact that his campaign realizes it's got a problem is smart, but I don't know that there's a way to overcome it. Hang on. I'm writing something critical of Teresa Tomlinson. Oh, you know, poor old Teresa Thomas and I, I just a, a little birdie just sent me this. Uh, and this is this is in, impressive to me. Um, I've got some exclusive audio for you here on the Eric Erickson show uh, regarding Teresa Tomlinson. And, and boy, what a time this comes for Teresa Tomlinson. She is the one of the Senate candidates vying to run against David Perdue. And she has uh, been attacked by the NAAC, NAACP for being tone deaf about uh, about the black community. And I've got this video from her two days ago. She was saying that black pastors aren't serious people. Yes, that, that's right. Teresa Tomlinson, who wants to be senator, doesn't think black pastors are serious people. Now, let me put this in proper context for you. Teresa Tomlinson was two days ago uh, talking to a group in Decatur, Georgia, and she started talking about her 2010 mayoral race in Columbus. Those of you down in Columbus listening right now, you you remember this race. She was running against Zeph Baker. Zeph Baker is a prominent member of the black community. He is a mega church pastor and was able to get into a runoff with Teresa Tomlinson. And what does Tomlinson say? That it was a serious time for serious people, and they wanted a steady hand. And I ended up winning with 68% of the vote. I ran in the runoff with an African-American minister of a megachurch whose dad had been an icon of the of Columbus, Georgia community. And it wasn't because they didn't like him. 
Uh, it was just because they realized it was a very serious time for very serious people. And, and frankly, much like what we're going through today. And they wanted a steady hand on the wheel uh, to navigate this, this, this new journey that we were on as a community. That's why I won. Um, so it was a very serious time for serious people, so they didn't go for the black minister. Um, that's going to go over real well in a black community that's already criticizing her for being out of touch with the black community. Does she not understand how, um, the black community works, uh, much of the black community, you know, I, so can we have a, a sidebar discussion here for a moment? I have a lot of friends who get very upset at the hypocrisy and they have a legitimate complaint, but they get very upset at the hypocrisy of uh, candidates being able to go campaign in black churches in ways that they never could in a white church. And they're right. It is hypocritical. Uh, you Democrats have much more latitude to go in and campaign in black churches than in white churches. Let me tell you a story about my experience campaigning in a black church. I used to be a campaign consultant. For a number of years, I was a lawyer, and I also ran campaigns out of my law office. And we went to a church. I was running a campaign with a candidate, and we went to a church. It was a very prominent, uh, very large church in middle Georgia. And it had a TV service. It had a TV ministry. It was a big church. And people love, they still to this day, love that pastor. And he introduced the candidate as being in the audience. And we were there for the whole, and it was a long service. You, you, you white folks who go to your local little Baptist or Presbyterian or Methodist church, and you're looking at the watch to make sure you're out of there within an hour so you can beat everybody else from the other churches to the all-you-can-eat buffet after lunch on, on Sunday, you need to go spend time in a black church. The sermon may last the hour. We were there for a long time. And the service was over. And the candidate was brought up. And they prayed over the candidate. I'm not making this up. They prayed over the candidate. It was not political. The pastor looks at his watch. He goes into the pulpit. He makes my candidate stay on the stage. He clears his throat. And he says, I am not making this up. He says, all right, y'all, the cameras are off. Let's get real. (laughs) And there, we're off to the races. He's in the pulpit and he says, essentially, um, this man has spent his life helping young black men, and his opponent has spent his life putting young black men in jail. (laughs) This man has spent his life, and his white guy, this man has spent his life going into the African-American community, helping lift people out of poverty. His opponent has helped keep them in poverty. This man has walked across the aisle, across races, across parties, across all demographics to improve people's lives. That man's been rounding them all up and putting them in jail. <laughs> and on it goes. <laughs> and then, and then, and I'm not making this up. And then he says, break out the offering plates. <laughs> And he starts passing the offering plate out of the church. And people are putting cash in the offering plate for us. (laughs) And I am trying not to poop my britches. I'm like, oh my God, this is so illegal. (laughs) The statute of limitations has run out on this, by the way. I can tell this story. (laughs) So they're literally, they're passing the offering plate and my candidate is on stage and his eyes are about the size of dinner plates. And he's thinking, oh, beep, we're going to jail. (laughs) So, so they collect the, the, I mean, people are throwing money into the offering plates and it's campaign contributions for us. And I'm thinking, oh, I mean, this we can't do this. 
this guy's he's gonna lose his 501c3 status but i mean he's like the cameras are off let's get real and he he does this from the stage my guy's on stage with him and the offering plates are piling up with cash so we get to the end of it and we got all this cash and my candidate thank god he thought on his feet told the church, I appreciate your support and every dollar in that offering plate. I hope it's a vote for me, but I don't want your money. I'm not here for your money. I just want your vote. Pastor, please take this money and use it for the good of the community. And oh, thank God. (laughs) All I could think was, Please don't take that money. Please don't take that money. Please don't take that money. And and thankfully he, I mean, he, he knew he and I were, we were both in there freaked out, but he won, he won. Um, my guy won. It, it, it was brilliant, but holy cow. I mean, and this happens, this happens and, and it's not supposed to happen. And it happens. Uh, it, it happens to, in the white community to some degree, but it really happens in the black community. And, um, that's, that, 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 that's, that's, that's a problem. Now, let me get off that tangent back to the other tangent. Here's here's the situation. After the Civil War, the black church became the institutional hub of the black community. Everything happened in the black church. People were fed from the church. People were protected by the church. People had advocacy from the church if they were in trouble with the law. It was the place women in the black community could go if their husbands were abusing them. It was the place men in the black community could go if they couldn't get hired by whites so they could find a job within the black community. They could take care of their own. They could sustain themselves. And in large part, with the collapse of the black family corresponds to some degree with the collapse in in the institutional strength of the black church, which should be revitalized. But that institutional strength to a degree has carried over into the 20th and now in the 21st century, where if you're in the black community, black churches are really the hub of your community existence. And so it's fundamentally different from the white community. And that's why I give a little bit of a pass to the black now you're not collecting money and stuff like that in churches. No, but why I give a little bit of a pass within the black community to the way politics is more uh, openly done in black churches than in white churches. It's because it's always been done and it has historic roots in the post-Civil War uh, United States in the Reconstruction era. It's something that's always been done because the black church is historically uh, so tied into the black community. Frankly, uh, the black community does a better job of tying their churches into their communities than the white community does with their churches. And there are historic reasons in this country that that is so, and they spring from slavery, Jim Crow, and the Civil War. And you should understand that. You can say it's wrong, and, and I'm not going to disagree with you, uh, that that uh, the white community is held to a different standard when it comes to politics in churches. It absolutely is. Uh, Democrats can get away with it. If a Republican goes and stands in church, look at uh, President Trump when he went to J.D. Greer, uh, not J.D. Greer, um, uh, what's his name, David Platt's church in, outside of Washington, D.C., and David Platt prayed for him, and David Platt was attacked. Uh, people wanted to challenge the 501c3 status of his church because he had the president on stage and he prayed for the president. And people like you can't do that this is a church separation of church and state you're not allowed to do that meanwhile democrats go into black churches across the country and do the exact same thing and more so with gusto attacking republicans from the pulpit turning it in turning what should be a religious message into a political message hillary clinton remember every time she'd go to the south and she'd get on stage say suddenly get a real southern accent she'd stand up there and she'd say y'all better vote for them democrats because them republicans is bad and jesus hates them And then she'd leave and suddenly lose that accent again. But please do understand, even if you disagree with me, for the historic reasons that I've laid out, I I give a little bit of a pass within the black community to why they do that. I think it's gone overboard in a lot of churches. It has gone overboard, and and in many cases, the IRS should step it up. And yes, there is a double standard in the press. There's always going to be a double standard in the press. 
but that's why. But now back to Teresa Tomlinson. Let me get us back on track here. Uh, let me play this audio again. This is Teresa Tomlinson talking about 2010. She's running against Zeph Baker, who is a mega church pastor, highly regarded, highly well-known person in Columbus. And I ended up winning with 68% of the vote. Wow. I ran in the runoff with an African-American minister of a mega church whose dad had been an icon of the of Columbus, Georgia community. And it wasn't because they didn't like him. Uh, it was just because they realized it was a very serious time for very serious people. And, and frankly, much like what we're going through today. And they wanted a steady hand on the wheel uh, to navigate this, this, this new journey that we were on as a community. That's why I won. That's why she won. Um, because she was running against a, a mega church pastor from the black community and it was a serious time for serious people. And Oh, mega church pastor from the black community, not a serious person, not going to be a steady hand on the wheel of the community. Who's more steady? The one with plugged into Jesus or the one who's not? I mean, this is, this is I, you know, she can say this to a white crowd in Decatur. And, and let's be clear here. She's talking to an uppity white crowd in Decatur. Making a disparaging comment about a black minister of note in Columbus, Georgia. The NAACP uh, says that uh, Teresa Tomlinson is completely out of touch with the African-American community. There are rumblings that uh, Ralph Warnock, he is the pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church, a prominent uh, African-American, is thinking of making a uh, play for Johnny Isaacson's seat. I wonder if she thinks he has a steady hand. wonder if she thinks uh, he's a serious person for serious times. Uh, maybe someone should ask her that. You know, I, I got to tell you, here's the thing about Teresa Tomlinson. Let, let me just be be real here with you, brutally honest. She's an opportunist. She's not a Democrat. She's not a Republican. She's an opportunist. And that's why she's having trouble raising money. That's why she's having trouble connecting with people, because she's an opportunist. You know, I, so I, I was in law school with people, and we used to have the joke about the, the, the joggers and the bear um, that uh, – Jogger number two had better odds than jogger number one when the bear was chasing him because the odds were jogger number one could trip and jogger number two would then see where not to trip and get ahead of jogger number one. And if he was lucky, he could stop, tie jogger number one's shoes in knots and take off running. Let the bear eat jogger number one. Teresa Tomlinson is jogger number two. Um, she's an opportunist, uh, the, the, the person who will, uh, do and say anything she can to get ahead, to get this, to get this. She wants it. She's hungry for it. Um, like one of the, one of the people who will stab friends in the back to get on a law review in law school. I'm, I am, I'm not a fan. I don't like politicians who convey a sense of being willing to say or do anything to get ahead. Take John Ossoff, compare John Ossoff to Teresa Tomlinson. I don't think John Ossoff is qualified to be in the U.S. Senate. But John Ossoff, he, at least you get a sense that when he says it, he actually means it. I mean, he says crazy stuff and he's a hyper progressive, but you can actually kind of get a sense that, yeah, this kid really is as progressive as he says. Teresa Tomlinson, she's out there attacking others in the Democratic Party as, as not being as progressive as her when her record as mayor was not actually that progressive. And you and I both know that she would get the nomination and suddenly say, oh, well, yeah, look at my record. My record wasn't as progressive. After campaigning by saying, oh, yeah, I'm the most progressive person in the race, she said, oh, no, I'm not that progressive. That's where we are with her. Ah, y'all, this 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 is a this is a a a woman who is hungry for the job, and people who are that desperate for jobs in politics are not the people you should want to give the job to. We still have um, the nonsense in uh, Adam Schiff speaking before the uh, House Intelligence Committee. Bill Taylor has now begun his testimony. Well, Let's listen to a little bit of on this. The events that are the subject of the committee's inquiry. I want to emphasize at the outset that while I am aware that the committee has requested my testimony as part of impeachment proceedings, I am not here to take one side or the other or to advocate for any particular outcome of these proceedings. My sole purpose is to provide facts as I know them about the incidents in question as well as my views about the strategic importance of Ukraine to the United States. By way of background, it has been a privilege for me to serve our country and the American people for more than 50 years. 
starting as a cadet at West Point, as you have mentioned, Mr. Chairman, then as an infantry officer for six years, including with the 101st Airborne Division in Vietnam, then at the Department of Energy, then as a member of a Senate staff, then at NATO, then with the State Department here and abroad in Afghanistan, Iraq, Jerusalem, and Ukraine. I retired from the State Department in 2009 to join the United States Institute of Peace. I'm neither a career member of the Foreign Service nor of the Civil Service. I am nonpartisan and have been appointed to my positions by every president from President Reagan to President Trump. Let me summarize my main points. First, Ukraine is a strategic partner of the United States, important for the security of our country, as well as Europe. Ukraine is on the front line of, in the conflict with a newly aggressive Russia. Second, even as we sit here today, the Russians are attacking Ukrainian soldiers in their own country and have been for the last four years. I saw this on the front line last week. The day I was there, a Ukrainian soldier was killed and four were wounded. Third, the security assistance we provide is crucial to Ukraine's defense and to the protection of the soldiers I met on the front line last week. It demonstrates to Ukrainians and Russians that we are Ukraine's reliable strategic partner. It is clearly in our national interest to deter further Russian aggression. And finally, as the committee is aware, I wrote that withholding security assistance in exchange for help with a domestic political campaign in the United States would be crazy. I believed that then, and I believe it now. Let me tell you why. On May 28th of this year, I met with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who asked me to rejoin the State Department and return to Kyiv to lead our embassy in Ukraine. It was and is a critical time for U.S.-Ukraine relations. I had served <clears throat> as ambassador to Ukraine from 2006 to 2009. <clears throat> having been nominated by George W. Bush and in the intervening 10 years had stayed engaged with Ukraine. Across the responsibilities I have had in public service, Ukraine is the highlight. And so Secretary Pompeo's offer to return as chief of mission was compelling. Since I left Ukraine in 2009, the country had continued to turn toward the West. But in 2013, Vladimir Putin was so threatened by the prospect of Ukraine joining the European Union that he tried to bribe the Ukrainian president. This triggered mass protests in the winter of 2013 that drove the, that president to flee to Russia in, in February 2014, but not before his forces killed 100 Ukrainian protesters in central Kyiv. Days later, Mr. Putin invaded Crimea holding a sham referendum at the point of Russian army rifles. The Russians absurdly claimed that 97% voted to join Russia. In early April, Putin sent his army and security forces into southeastern Ukraine to generate illegal armed formations and puppet governments in what we know as Donbas. You can see this on the map in the right-hand portion, in the eastern portion of the country. 14, this is Ukraine. Bill Taylor. He is the acting ambassador to Ukraine from the United States, appointed by President Trump, uh, making his case for why what President Trump did was wrong. If you listen to him, what he said was in his opening statement, I thought it was bad. Um, it, it appears he's making a personal assumption, and that's what the Republicans will pounce on. Um, he's going to be testifying for most of the day, and then they'll have another person testify. Now, I'll get into this when we come back, and there's some fallout from the Northwestern University stuff I talked about yesterday. I want to follow up with you on. Yo, I got a sponsor this week. I am so excited. About it. I've actually been waiting for this news um, because I'm a subscriber uh, to their English uh, publication, uh, The Spectator is coming to the United States. The Spectator is uh, the longest-running magazine in the English language. It's been published in the U.K. since... 
gosh, I, it's like 190, 191 years, and now it's getting ready. It's going to do an American edition. It's launching, uh, well, it started, I guess, last month in print. It's going to be delivered monthly. The U.S. edition is going to be just like the U.K. magazine. If you know anything about The Spectator, it's brilliant. It's fearless, uh, very honest, and very conservative. Doesn't mince words when it comes to conservatism, and it's just it's tremendous. I highly, highly encourage you uh, to get it. It's going to have Christopher Buckley, P.J. O'Rourke, uh, Christopher Caldwell, uh, Toby Young, uh, Roger Scruton, so many more. You'll get British humor as well, which I grew up with overseas. I am a huge fan of The Spectator, literally. I'm not just saying this because they're a sponsor. I didn't even know they were going to sponsor. I'm so excited. I love The Spectator. Uh, you can check it out. Go to spectator.us slash subscribe. That's spectator.us slash subscribe. And then use offer code Eric, E-R-I-C-K. You'll get a free trial. Do it. You will love the spectator. It is so great to finally have their voice here in the United States. Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here, the Eric Erickson Show. From the North Georgia mountains to the Florida line, from the Chattahoochee to the coast. Uh, yeah, I cover the entire state of Georgia and beyond, thanks to the series of tubes known as the Internet. You can call in and be a part of this program and have your voice heard in the entire part of the state. 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425 is the phone number. Uh, the hearings are underway on Capitol Hill for impeachment. Ambassador Bill Taylor is currently testifying. Let me pull up the audio so you can get a flavor of this. It is happening live right now. odd when Ambassador Sondland told me on June 28th that he did not wish to include most of the regular interagency participants in a call planned with President Zelensky later that day. Ambassador Sondland, Ambassador Volker, Secretary Perry, Secretary Perry, and I were on this call, dialing in from different locations. However, Ambassador Sondland said he wanted to make sure no one was transcribing or monitoring as they added President Zelensky to the call. Also, before President Zelensky joined the call, Ambassador Volker separately told the U.S. participants that he, Ambassador Volker, planned to be explicit with President Zelensky in a one-on-one -on -one meeting in Toronto on July 2nd. In that meeting, Ambassador Volker planned to make clear what President Zelensky should do to get the White House meeting. I did not understand what this meant, but Ambassador Volker said he would relay that President Trump wanted to see rule of law transparency, but also specifically cooperation on investigations to get to the bottom of things. Once President Zelensky joined the call, the conversation was focused on energy policy and the war in Donbass. President Zelensky also said he looked forward to the White House visit President Trump had offered in his May 29th letter. By mid-July, it was becoming clear to me that the meeting President Zelensky wanted was conditioned on the investigations of Burisma and alleged Ukrainian interference in the 2016 U.S. elections. It was also clear that this condition was driven by the irregular policy channel I had come to understand was guided by Mr. Giuliani. In a regular NSC secure video conference call on July 18th, I heard a staff person from the Office of Management and Budget say that there was a hold on security assistance to Ukraine, but could not say why. Toward the end of an otherwise normal meeting, a voice on the call, the person was off screen, said that she was from OMB and her boss had instructed her not to approve any additional spending on security assistance for Ukraine until further notice. I and others sat in astonishment. Ukrainians were fighting Russians and counted on not only the training and weapons, but also the assurance of U.S. support. All that the OMB staff person said was, that the directive had come from the president to the chief of staff to OMB. In an instant, I realized that one of the key pillars of our strong support for Ukraine was threatened. The irregular policy channel was running contrary to the goals of longstanding U.S. policy. Hey, I, hey, pause, freeze. Whoa, whoa. Okay, right, right there. I'm glad he, he got there immediately so I don't have to keep playing this. Here, here's where I think this is going to head. Bill Taylor did not like the direction that President Trump was charting. Bill Taylor, you heard him say earlier, he has been long involved in Ukraine. 
He has been long involved in the politics of helping Ukraine. He believes Ukraine is a strategic partner of the United States. He believes that we have an obligation to Ukraine. We have made past promises by past presidents to Ukraine. We've been propping up Ukraine. And uh, they are in our strategic interest to help them because of the growing threat from Russia. And the president didn't want to do that. And Bill Taylor didn't like the direction the president wanted to go. And I suspect what we're going to have happen here is the Republican talking point is going to be that Bill Taylor didn't like what the president wanted to do. And that's not impeachable. And and that the whistleblower himself was a partisan operative who didn't like the direction that the president was headed and as a result uh, decided to blow the whistle. And in both cases, that what you're doing is they are asserting that their interest and their prerogative and the direction they want to go is paramount to the interests of the United States based on the democratically elected president of the United States and his policy position changes. It is it is well settled by now that most of these people do not like the foreign policy direction the president charted with Ukraine. I don't either, by the way. But he was the lawfully elected president of the United States, and it is his prerogative to do it. The American people elected him. It is not my prerogative or Bill Taylor's prerogative or or the whistleblower's prerogative to defy the president on that. And I suspect what we're going to have here is Republicans seize on what Taylor was just saying, that he did not think it was a good idea. He did not like it. Um, I, I think it is going to be the way the Republicans get the president out of this. Likewise, the change in the Democrats, I'm seeing now even on social media, the Democrats are changing their talking point. I played this audio in the first hour. I want to play it again. Congresswoman Speer and Congressman Buck, they're both involved in this initial process with the Intelligence Committee. They're both Democrats. Let me play you the audio again. Actually, Aaron, I have been speaking out about the potentiality of it being bribery for some time. The elements of bribery are there. You have a president using his official office, um, using taxpayer money to demand from a foreign government that they um, are bribed to do an investigation to dig up dirt on the president's opponent in the upcoming election. Uh, The corrupt intent is there as well in many ways. Uh, Probably the most obvious is that they put the uh, transcript or the summary of that phone call on July 25th into a special server so that they could cover it up. Uh, Not to mention the fact that there are many other uh, evidence of uh, corrupt intent in that the president has lied. He said that it was a verbatim uh, transcript when in fact it was a summary and uh, there is evidence now that um, things were kept out of that summary. But we have the corpus and the corpus is the summary of the telephone call which the president corroborated himself by releasing it. Bribe, you see. It was a bribe now. Remains to be seen. The American public is going to have its first opportunity to actually see and hear uh, these patriots, these foreign diplomats, this decorated war veteran who have served both Republicans and Democratic administrations. It's not just ink on a page anymore. They get to actually hear what they have to say. Moreover, there is always the prospect that somebody will ask a question that in some way reveals new information, including that which wasn't even uh, disclosed in the deposition thus far. As you point out, we have already seen the closed door testimony that has been released now from Ambassador Bill Taylor, others who are set to appear publicly. Why do you think this will change minds? Well, first of all, I don't know that everybody's tuned in quite yet to ink on a page, as I say, uh, depositions in the written word. But I think uh, there'll be an increased and acute heightened awareness of what's going on here. Look, we're all returning to the nation's capital with uh, an extremely sober feeling. It's, it, it's, it actually causes us to be pretty reflective. It's impossible to exaggerate the gravity of what we're about to undertake when you consider that this is the second most serious responsibility that the Congress has, second only to its authority to declare war. So listen, people are going to be tuning in, and some of them will be hearing it for the first time. Some of them will be receiving it uh, in ways that are more powerful than ink on a page. And thirdly, there is the prospect that there'll be new information really uh, released. So I, I do think that people's minds are going to be changed and shaped because the truth is there is a mountain of evidence 
a mountain of evidence that the president did, in fact, bribe or extort Ukraine in an attempt to satisfy his own personal political gain. How how is it a bribe? I mean, we, we've gone from this is the most interesting thing I'm hearing this morning and seeing from Democrats is they're dropping quid pro quo and they're going to bribe. And I, I don't know that that's the smart play, but the reason they're doing it, you need to understand, is that polling tells them um, that most people do not understand what a quid pro quo is. And they got to go from Latin to something they understand. And here is the definition of a bribe, a sum of money or other inducement offered or given to bribe someone as a verb to persuade someone to act in one's favor illegally or dishonestly by gift of money or other inducement. There's a fundamental problem, though. The president did withhold the money from Ukraine. But Congress appropriated the money. So I guess the argument from the Democrats now is that the president said he would give Ukraine the money if they if they did do something. But Mick Mulvaney has already said that the money had to go anyway, that they could hold it up till the end of the year. But at the end of the year, the money had to be dispersed um, uh, under federal law. They can't stop uh, an author- authorized um, payment by Congress. They can hold it, but they can't stop it. And so they would have to disperse it. So letting it go is somehow, but this doesn't make any sense. And this is part of the problem for the Democrats. Now, you, you, can, you can be mad at me, and man, I, I put this on Twitter, and all the people who've wanted the president impeached and never wanted him elected are like, I can't believe you're saying this. Y'all, I think Americans fundamentally understand that a bribe is giving someone money, but if Congress appropriated the money and the president gave them the money, it's not now a bribe. So if Congress appropriates uh, money to you, the voter, Congress authorizes refunds. And the president gives you the money. Is the president bribing you? Are they going to impeach the president for bribing you because Congress authorized money? I mean, this this is a problem. If we're at a if we're at an intellectually honest level, it is a problem. The president wanted to withhold money to get uh, a, a, a corruption investigations going in Ukraine when there were no strings attached. It is a problem for the Democrats that they now say this is a bribe that he let the money go. The money with was held. They didn't do anything, and and then the money went forward. I, you, I, at what point are we supposed to sacri- sacrifice intellectual honesty here? Uh, apparently, we're supposed to readily sacrifice intellectual honesty to placate one side or the other. I think it is deeply problematic that the president did what he did. I do. I, I absolutely do. I don't think the president should have done it. But I don't know that it's impeachable. You're going to have to give me something more there. And I haven't seen it yet. Maybe they'll get it. But listening to Bill Taylor's opening statement, it seems very clear that Bill Taylor's concern is that the president did something that Bill Taylor thought was against American policy. And that's why he was upset. Never mind that it's the president who sets that American policy. And then we have the whistleblower matter and the partisanship of the whistleblower. Republicans want to out the whistleblower. Here's a report from Fox on this. Mike, what's the argument from Republicans to say they get ready to head into these hearings? Well, Republicans are frustrated, one, because they don't have any of their witnesses that they've asked for so far. We are told they are still being considered, uh, but they are basically saying that uh, they feel like tomorrow is a critical day, and Democrats are making the case that money did flow to Ukraine, um, but that the president wanted help first with political matters here at home. If it's intended to that for that debate to obfuscate the basic fact that there was a a concerted effort by this administration through various sources to persuade Ukraine to get involved in investigating one of the president's political rivals. If we miss that point, I think that would be uh, a mistake and I think it would be bad for the country. Put on Ambassador Volker. Okay, this was these this guy was the Democrats first witness. Came in it didn't go very well for them. You've all seen the transcripts. He came in voluntarily. Uh, the transcripts are out. Why on earth would Volker not be there? He was the special envoy to Ukraine. Now, that is, I think the Republicans, listen, the, the Democrats have to worry about the optics of this. I don't care. I, I don't care for the president. I, I've said I'll vote for him in 2020. I, I wish I could vote for Pence instead. But that's not going to happen. I don't think impeachment is going to happen. I don't think the president is going to be convicted. I don't care whether you like the president or not. What I do care about, though, is that we at least recognize how the optics are playing here. If you can set aside your partisanship one way or the other, 
if the witnesses favorable to the Republicans don't get to be called, I think it's a problem. And frankly, I think it's a problem for the Democrats who rushed out to say they wanted to hear from the whistleblower who are now saying, oh, we don't need to hear from the whistleblower. After we now know that came out, the Democrats change in tone came out after we found out that the whistleblower coordinated with Adam Schiff's office. Adam Schiff this morning in his opening statement says he doesn't know who the whistleblower is. His office coordinated with the whistleblower. and He doesn't know who the whistleblower is. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, listen, the Democrats are going to screw this. Never underestimate the ability of the Democrats to screw this up. And if what we have from the witnesses today is that they did not like the direction the president was taking the country, that's not impeachable. What we Now, I, I just, I'm seeing an email come through from a listener right now in Athens asking, what would it take for me to support impeachment of the president? I say, I don't like the president. What would it take? If the president wanted information to use against Joe Biden in 2020, I think it's impeachable. I do. He wanted an investigation of Burisma. He wanted an investigation of 2016. Did the president actually want this investigation to go after Joe Biden in 2020? And Democrats say, yes, he did. Republicans say, no, he didn't. And what does it matter if he did? I say it matters if he does, but we haven't gotten there with the evidence yet. But there's another aspect of this. It's a political situation. Impeachment is political. We're less than a year from the election. Why do we need impeachment right now? Well, why do we need impeachment? Why, why are the Democrats rushing it? You know, it took eight months behind closed doors before the Democrats decided to unveil their Nixon impeachment. It took eight months behind closed doors. Adam Schiff coordinated with the whistleblower for a couple of weeks. They were behind closed doors for a month, and now suddenly they're moving forward. That They are rushing this. Why are they rushing this? And they're rushing it to their own detriment. Uh, and I'm not sure why they need to when they can they can they can have their listen. It is their right as as the the ruling party in the House of Representatives. They can do this as an oversight investigation. They can collect all the data and then they can give it to the Democrats and they can use it on the campaign trail in 2020. They can make their case for removing the president to the voters in November based on this information. The fact that they're not and that they're rushing it suggest they're really just trying to weaken the president, and they know they're not going to take him out. If the Democrats are serious here, they don't need to convince you, and they don't need to convince me. They need to convince the Senate, and they're doing a terrible job of trying to convince the Senate. Yes, you can call in 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425, and I'll be sending out a recipe tomorrow. If you want that, text the word RECIPE to 33777. Text RECIPE to 33777. Every week I try to send out a recipe with the holidays. Try to be mindful of that and your time and give you some good stuff. What I'm probably going to do is send out two recipes tomorrow um, from my book. Uh, and it, they're what I make when my family comes over for Thanksgiving. It's a French toast casserole and a sausage bake. You make them the night before you keep them in the fridge. The next morning you pop them in the oven for 45 minutes. They cook at the same temperature so you can give a sweet and a savory. If you got a bunch of guests coming, you, you make a big 13 by nine casserole dish of this stuff and it's quite tasty and gives them something sweet, something savory. Uh, let's go jump back into the hearings if we can, as uh, Bill Taylor continues to talk to Congress. I also said, I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with the political campaign. Ambassador Sondland responded about five hours later that I was incorrect about President Trump's intentions. The president has been crystal clear, no quid pro quos of any kind. During our meeting, during our call on September 8th, Ambassador Sondland tried to explain to me that President Trump is a businessman. When a businessman is about to sign a check to someone who owes him something, the businessman asks that person to pay up before signing the check. Ambassador Volker used the same language several days later while we were together at the Yalta European Strategy Conference. I argued to both that the explanation made no sense. The Ukrainians did not owe President Trump anything, and holding up security assistance for domestic political gain was crazy as I had said in my text message to Ambassador Sondland and Volker on September 9th. Finally, on September 11th, I learned that the hold had been lifted and security assistance would be provided. I was not told the reason why the hold had been lifted. The next day, I personally conveyed the news to President Zelensky and the Ukrainian foreign minister. 
And I again reminded Mr. Yermak of the high strategic value of bipartisan support for Ukraine and the importance of not getting involved in other countries' elections. My fear at the time was that since Ambassador Sondland had told me President Zelensky had already agreed to do a CNN interview, President Zelensky would make a statement regarding investigations that would have played into domestic U.S. politics. I sought to confirm through Mr. Daniel Luke that President Zelensky was not planning to give such an interview to the media. While Mr. Daniel Luke initially confirmed that on September 12th, I noticed during a meeting on the morning of September 13th at President Zelensky's office that Mr. Yermak looked uncomfortable in response to the question. Again, I asked Mr. This Donald is Bill Taylor testifying live before the United States House of Representatives Intelligence Committee as they begin their formal public uh, inquiry, impeachment inquiry. The battleground is, is being shaped up here between Republicans saying these guys just didn't like the direction President Trump was going and the Democrats saying a bribe was at play here. We'll get into that. Take your phone calls when we come back. It is Eric Erickson here. Welcome. Uh, Impeachment inquiry underway in Congress. We will go back, jump back into the hearing here in a minute. Sonny Perdue, Georgia former governor and now Secretary of Agriculture, is in hot water with the Senate Democrats. For what? Uh, Turns out that the uh, disproportionate, according to the Democrats, a disproportionate at least, amount of farm aid is flowing to farmers in Georgia. Yeah, that's right. Uh, farmers in Georgia are are getting the most money. Uh, this from the AJC, a new report from Democrats in the Senate found the Trump administration uh, has showered more subsidies on southern farmers than anywhere else uh, it, because of the trade war with China. And there's implications for Sonny Perdue. Uh, you might not be surprised to discover that Georgia benefited the most from the first round of distributions. From the Kansas City Star, Purdue's home state of Georgia received the most money per farm acre, according to the study, at $52.35 per acre. The next four top recipients were Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, and Arkansas. Farmers in Georgia have already received over $50 per acre in the first round of 2019 payments, while farmers in 34 other states received $25 or less, including 14 states that received $10 or less. And the Democrats are livid about that, thinking that their states should get more. They don't want equality, and that's that's important here. They don't want equality. They they want more money for theirs. Uh, I told you people this was going to happen. They took the baby Trump balloon, you know, the obnoxious baby Trump balloon that the media just loves. It's, it's got a, uh, a giant orange Donald Trump baby in diapers, and they floated around at protests. They took it to the LSU Go Tigers Alabama game, and uh, someone named Hoyt, of course it was a Hoyt. I figured it would be a Clyde or a Bubba or, or, or a Sonny, but nope, it was a Hoyt. Uh, Hoyt stabbed the balloon, stabbed it deflated the balloon. He was arrested for criminal vandalism. Hoyt went on the the um, Rick and Bubba show and said that this is the first time he's aware of Democrats are upset or the left is upset that a baby got chopped up. <laughs> Yo, yeah, God bless him. Um, if this was a federal crime, I would be advocating the president pardon him after that. Yeah, he goes he goes on the radio show and says, this is the first time in in his knowledge, this is the first time Democrats have ever been upset about a baby getting chopped up. <laughs> God bless him. God bless him. Uh, Hoyt. Of course, it was a Hoyt. <laughs> Not a Clyde, not a Sonny, not a Bubba, not a Sonny Bubba June Bug Johnson. It was a Hoyt who stabbed that balloon. Uh, Let's go back. We'll listen in for a few more minutes here. Bill Taylor uh, being questioned by Adam Schiff. I take it if the provision of U.S. military assistance would save Ukrainian lives, lives, that any delay in that assistance may also cost Ukrainian lives. Is that is that true? Mr. Chairman, of course, it's hard to, prov- to, to draw any direct lines between any particular element of security assistance and any particular death on the battlefield. But it is certainly true that that assistance had enabled Ukrainian armed forces to be effective and deter um, and to be able to take countermeasures to the, to the attacks that the Russians had. had. And I think you said that uh, a Ukrainian soldier lost their life while you were visiting Donbass. We keep very careful track of the casualties, and I noticed on the next day uh, the, the information that we got that one was killed, four, people, four soldiers were wounded on that day. And indeed, Ukrainians lose their lives 
Every week. Every week. I think you also testified that Russia was watching closely to gauge the level of American support for the Ukrainian government. Um, why is that significant? This is significant, Mr. Chairman, because the Ukrainians, in particular under this new administration, are eager to end this war. And they are eager to end it in a way that the, that the Russians leave their territory. These negotiations, like all negotiations, are difficult. Ukrainians would like to be able to negotiate from a, from a position of strength, or at least more strength than they now have. Part of that strength, part of the ability of the Ukrainians to negotiate against the Russians, with the Russians, for, for an end to the war in Donbass, depends on the United States and other See, I think the Democrats are making a mistake here in this line of questioning um, because essentially what's going on is, is Bill Taylor is showing he cares deeply about Ukraine. He cares deeply about Ukraine as a a way to hold back the Russians. He cares deeply about Rush, uh, Russian power growing and thinks it's a bad thing. And he he very, very much wants to... Uh, have a strong relationship between the U.S. and Ukraine. Keep in mind, he's been Ukrainian ambassador. Going back to George W. Bush, he's floated in and out of Ukrainian foreign policy. He's kept ties up there, um, highly respected in Ukraine. And it, this is a this is a policy dispute situation right now uh, where the Democrats are with this. Now, there is some breaking news here. Uh, Taylor is expected to talk about a staffer of his, who overheard Sondland and President Trump talking and overheard that um overheard that um I'm sorry my my mind went blank uh, the, the, the Sondland and the president talk about Ukraine and the staffer according to Bill Taylor today uh the staffer heard the president insist that the investigations against Burisma and 2016 happen. Uh, not a Biden investigation, a Burisma investigation, that they were contingent. Uh, we don't know who the staffer is. Uh, he will be asked about this. House Democrats saying they're very interested in this portion of his testimony that he said he had this knowledge. It did not come up behind closed doors. Now that we have that transcript, it was never raised at that time. Uh, the Republicans will want to know why he didn't raise it at the time. My bet is, and again, I'm just betting here, spitballing it, is that after his testimony, the staffer reached out to him and gave him the information. Um, they're continuing down this line uh, of questioning as to why we needed to help Russia. Adam Schiff asking uh, William Taylor right now, the acting ambassador, why we needed to help, uh, the significance of withholding money, uh, Congress's... All righty. Uh, sorry about that, folks. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we're continuing to deal with the cold front coming through Georgia and power fluctuations impacting everything, including uh, inside the studio. Um, so thankfully, we got some backup tape. We can roll. So now uh, let, let's get back into uh, this. I actually want to shift gears as this plays out. Uh, Bill Taylor continuing to testify. We're going to hear from other people throughout the day. Stick with the station and we're you'll be hearing this throughout the day. The, the updates uh, going into other shows. <sighs> I got to play this audio for you, though. Um, this is, you know, the indoctrination that's happening in schools now. Um, a video has been put out uh, on education, on an education platform about discussing transgenderism in public schools. And I want to play for you some of the audio now. Uh, I, it, it, it's not very sensitive audio. Um, but this is a these these are two women talking about um, gender. Well, I assume one for sure is a woman. Uh, um, uh, before some young kids, young kids like like elementary, middle school kids, listen to part of this. Hi, I'm Eva, a sex researcher. And I'm Eva, a sex researcher. I use the pronouns she and her because I'm a woman. And when I was your age, I used to be a girl. Gender is how you feel on the inside about whether you're a boy or a girl, a man or a woman. If you're non-binary, feel like neither or both. People can also be fluid, feel more like female, more like male, on a, based on a different day or time. It's really individual. Absolutely. Everyone born with a vulva is a girl. True or false? Or identifies as a girl. Not everybody is sure, and that makes sense. But our genitals actually don't determine our gender. So some people born with vulvas can be boys. 
us learn a little bit more about gender, we actually have an extra special visitor to sex ed school. I have been through the spectrum, if we were to say a spectrum, of like boys and girls. Uh, you know, we're, there's a separation of church and state that the left loves. And I, I'm having a hard time wondering why this isn't uh, part of that separation of church and state. Um, in all seriousness, why isn't it? I mean, this is a religion, and this is this is an educational video to indoctrinate our children on a religious view. There's no science to back up this view, and yet you're you're a bigot if if you say that. The whole thing is very bizarre that we're seeing in public education around the country these days. We are seeing more and more uh, just a contemptuousness of uh, traditionalism, but more than that, a a contemptuousness of any science that uh, contradicts their cult-like religious views on gender and sexuality. And now they are, they're, (laughs) they're going into schools and doing indoctrination videos. This isn't science and they're not educating. This is indoctrination and and the left is totally okay with it. Uh, They won't let a Christian come in and, and share with the school about Jesus. They won't let a Muslim come in and share about Muhammad. They won't let anyone else come in and share their religion, but this religious view they will allow in the door and they will claim somehow that that it's not a religion when it absolutely is. It's got its own dogma. It's got its own orthodoxy. It's got its own heretics. Uh, This is a religion. And this is one reason why the president's campaign so much wants to make the culture war a play. Now, that didn't work in Kentucky. The culture war did not work in Kentucky. But it got close. And in fact, the Republicans swept everything else, which suggests that had a lot to do with Matt um, uh, Matt Bevan personally. It's just it, it's, it's fascinating to me. Um, and... I'm I'm just uh, I'm I'm amazed now at the at the left's willingness to try to indoctrinate our kids in public schools. They're not educating. They're, they're not explaining the science. Uh, they're doing religious indoctrination in schools uh, for transgenderism. It is a by faith issue for them, and it just it it's staggering. Uh, is it any wonder that the movement for homeschooling is rising in this country? It is Eric Erickson here, and I want to really put the impeachment hearing in perspective for you. Um, the the Democrats, they're asking questions of Bill Taylor. I don't want to float back into his audio here at the end of the show. What I want to do is I want to play you the competing narrative. Um, and what I mean by that is here's the president of the United States on the campaign trail. But everything that we've achieved is under threat from the left-wing ideology that demands absolute conformity, relentless regulation, and a top-down control of the entire U.S. economy. Far-left politicians in our nation's capital want a massive government takeover of health care. They want to give government bureaucrats domination over every aspect of your business and your life. They want to eliminate American oil and natural gas. They want to enlist us in global projects designed to redistribute American wealth and kill American jobs all over our nation. Washington's Democrats and their radical agenda of socialism would demolish our economy reinstate the avalanche of regulations that have already ended, decimate the middle class, and totally bankrupt our nation. As long as I'm president, America will never be a socialist country. One more, one more. Nearly 7 million people have been lifted off, very importantly, food stamps. 7 million people off of food stamps. And we're getting Americans off of welfare and back into the workforce. (laughs) Nearly 2.5 million Americans have risen out of poverty. That's a record. The rate of African American and Hispanic American families in poverty has plummeted to the lowest level ever recorded by far. Most of you people wouldn't know these numbers because most of you aren't very active in the market. But since my election, the S&P 500 is up 
over 45 percent. The Dow Jones is up over 50 percent. And the Nasdaq is up 60 percent, slightly more. Now, just so you understand there, he was joking there. That was a, a finance group he was talking to that uh, they're not active in the market. Um, this is the juxtaposition for the Democrats as they begin the public impeachment inquiry today. The president is on the campaign trail touting the economy, touting jobs. And they're there tied up on whether or not the president uh, should have withheld money appropriated by Congress to Ukraine. And was it a bribe? Was it a quid pro quo? Here's what's going to happen if they pass articles of impeachment out of the House of Representatives. It's going to go to the United States Senate, and there will be a trial in January. Richard Burr, the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, says that trial will last uh, six to eight weeks. Um, let me see if I can pull up something real quick. Democratic primary calendar calendar 2020 uh what is the there used to be a um a a, yeah here we go there used to be a great website green book or something and i think it's gone away um so the calendar we will have iowa in less than 100 days and then we will have new hampshire You'll have Nevada and South Carolina, and the Democrats will be tied up for a good portion of that. And when they're tied up with a good portion of that, you're you're going to have all sorts of problems. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, here, here's the day. Iowa, February 3rd. February 11th will be New Hampshire. February 22nd will be Nevada. February 29th will be South Carolina. So you're you're in a, a you're in a six to eight week trial, according to Richard Burr. You're in a six to eight week trial that takes out off the campaign trail a number of the Senate Democrats. Uh, they're not going to be able to campaign. Uh, let's see, Gillibrand has dropped out, um, but you've got. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, you've got Elizabeth Warren will be out. Bernie Sanders will be out. Amy Klobuchar will be out. Kamala Harris will be out. Cory Booker will be out. Michael Bennett will be out. Uh, yeah, remember Michael Bennett from Colorado. He's still running. They, they'll all be out. They, they won't be able to campaign. They won't be able to talk on TV. They won't be able to leave Washington, D.C. They'll be out. And you know the Republicans are going to make it painful for him in the Senate for going down this road, and the Democrats are only just now doing that calculation. Now, here's your really wild card scenario. Again, let me give you the primary calendar. February 3rd, Iowa. February 11th, uh, New Hampshire. February 22nd, Nevada. February 29th, South Carolina. March 3rd is Super Tuesday. Super Tuesday is Alabama, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Vermont, and Virginia. George is not until March 24th. What if they don't start the trial until the end of January? It's going to be a six to eight week trial. They could miss the Democrats in the Senate could miss Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina, Alabama, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Vermont, and Virginia. They could miss all of those states. That would actually be pretty funny, would it not? You do an eight-week trial, and you don't start it until the towards the end of January. The Democrats, they're going to have a real hard time campaigning, those Senate Democrats. Uh, now, Mayor Pete and Joe Biden will absolutely love it. If anything, the Republicans doing this ensure that uh, it's going to be one of those two as a nominee. And meanwhile, the president's going to campaign the whole time, too. The president will campaign. The president will be out there. And he'll be fundraising off impeachment, building more of a war chest to define the Democrats. That's the position the Democrats have put themselves in by doing what they're doing.